in the listener comments. Hello and welcome to the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, we're recording this on Sunday morning, January 14th, 2024. I'm Larry Rhodes, or DJ Doubter 5. And as usual, we have our co-host Wombat on the line with us. Hello, Wombat. He dribbles, he shoots the three, he scores! Yeah, that's Wombat. Always scoring. <coughs> Excuse me. Our guests today are Keith Simple. Welcome. And the Dread Hello. Pirate. Dread Pirate Higgs all the way from Western Canada. At oh, minus 37 oh. degrees Celsius. Yeah, it's pretty darn cold. Or it really, cold. really, really, really cold American. Yeah, my goodness. Digital Free Thought Radio Hour is a talk radio show about atheism, free thought, rational thought, humanism, and the sciences. And conversely, we'll also talk about religion, religious faiths, Pastafarianism, gods, holy books, and superstition. And if you get the feeling you're the only non-believer in your town, well, you're just not. Here in Knoxville, in the middle of the Bible Belt, we have a group of over 1,100 of us. We're the Atheist Society of Knoxville, or ASK, and we'll tell you more about us after the mid-show break. So be sure to stick around. Wombat, what's our topic today? I want to talk about growing pains and why hobbies that we take on also have sort of like the the glory and the the guts, the <laughs> the the great stuff. And the not so great stuff, the cool and the complicated. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about it. As also, we... the the philosophical growth. True, and, true. Uh, you gave me an alliteration. I can't listen. The the philosophical and the factual. How I don't know. You want to? There, you, there you go. That but works. As you expand, you'll tend to like hit barriers and that push your comfort zones into to mandatorily new areas. And we'll talk about how that that's part of growing pains and why it's important to still stress yourself in that capacity. But before we do, I'd love to go into our first entree of the talk today, which is our own noodley passage by our own Dread Pirate Higgs. Would you mind leading us on our weekly invocation? Arr, our noodley lord, who art in a colander, el dante be thy noodles. Thy blood be rum, thy sauce be yum with meat, as it is with vegetables. Give us this day our garlic bread, and forgive us our cussing, as we forgive those who cuss against us. And lead us not into ketoism, but deliver us some carbs, for thine are the meatballs, and the sauces, and the grogs, whenever and ever. Oh, oh man. Oh, man. <laughs> Keith is getting hmm. to this, too. Uh, Keith, wonderful to have you on the show again. You're looking in super high fidelity than ever before. What's different? Oh, I have a uh, nerd friend. <laughs> that's you pretty much it i have a i have a friend who understands uh how the cameras work okay. that's pretty much it are you calling yeah. them from like a dslr setup i mean there's like a really nice bokeh behind you and everything like wh wh what what did you get i do yeah so i i've been updating all my stuff for the podcast you know so like the 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 computer's new the camera's got a real high-end lens you know and everything wow. um and it it self focuses, which is why you got such a good chin earlier. <laughs> 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 Just that chiseled chin for you, you know. Nice, nice, um, nice. It's all it's all coming together. I mean, I mean, literally, like I said, you know, because I I um it was a late one for us. Plus, the drive home last night was white knuckle, like mm. white knuckle. It's not quite as cold as where dread is, but it was minus ten, I think. Um, so it was pretty brutal. Wow. Is there an then, Irish accent. Yes, sir. Ah, okay. Oh, Dread, have you guys not met before? Okay, so Dread, no. yeah, this is a uh, key symbol. Uh, I'll do a quick. A musician. Time. More than welcome to ah, okay, cool. the reason why his chin's so chiseled is he's a professional singer, multi music <laughs> music artist, but you know, constantly uses this job for smiling, promos, and and singing the the true gospel. He's a uh, if I can <laughs> if I can use this appropriately, sort of like a uh, 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 you do music that speaks to the 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 truth of being secular minded, particularly in a world that's covered in dogma, right? Would you mind talking about that? Yeah, I'd love to. Holy moly! Um, <laughs> so I I do I do have a band called the Siberium Dread that's like allows me to talk about all this stuff 
Um, okay. You know, it, like, like the single we just released, it, it, actually, I think you guys, I should send you the link if I didn't already. I think maybe some of you guys did see it, but it's called Wrong Turn, and it's basically a a, a, a metaphor for going too far right in your politics, mm. essentially, and how that leads to bad choices and bad decisions on all things moral and all things political. The more the more right you get, the more things become black and white instead of gray, which is what all things really are. All morals yeah. um, dilemmas are always like there's right and wrong, but there's also a million kind of okays in between. And ju just like when you see um, a bunch of uh, hominids uh, or hom homo skulls, you can't tell which one is actually human and which one isn't because there are just too many gray areas of right. choice. It's, you know? a, it's, it's exactly a spectrum rather thing. than a dichotomy, right? Right, right. Right, and everything is like, yeah, every decision or every moral dilemma is always that way. I've never even, I've never been presented with one that isn't, okay, there's definitely a kind of a strong moral positive end and a strong negative end, but there's, there's all sorts of choices in between I can think of that aren't necessarily black and white. Yeah. And cool. what's just to touch on that, just a quick thing. A lot of times with science is we generate models to help simplify or make difficult concepts more uh, util utilizable. Right. So like I might make a map that's flat that that I could use for transporting myself from one city to another city but it's using a flat earth model to get me to where I need to go. It's not calculating the curvature in every hill or the curvature of the earth because I don't need to know that to get from here to McDonald's, right? But that model is not what real reality is. And oftentimes in science, we will come up with models to dictate how social things should work or how statistics on groups of populations might work. And we need to recognize that this the model might be black and white, but it is at best a caricature of what reality is. And we there's always room for nuance if we're willing to continue to engage with more observation and realize that we can always improve the model to take in that nuance. But we should never be so standfast and say, nope, it's just this or that. This is the dichotomy. It's like, that's great. But even numbers aren't like, I can never have two apples. Or, I, I, I throw this example out. I can never have two apples because there's always going to be Slightly, what do we mean by a unit of apple? Like, is it based on mass? Because this apple is slightly more than this apple. This apple weighs more. This apple might be green. Are these the same thing? If they're not the same thing, how can I have two of them, right? So we need to understand that we come up with variables and those are at best just abstractions of reality. And we might have a very concrete model, but we still have very nuanced reality that we're placing that off of, which is why science is cool because we can continue to engage and interact with stuff like that or make music or make art based off of it. This is the beauty of being alive, like figuring out how the universe works with all of its nuance and taking it in and improving our understanding of the universe alongside it. Go on ahead, Kate. Uh, Tyrone, it's funny that you said, because that's also what it's like when I'm writing lyrics about this stuff, because, you know, you've got this very complex idea yeah. and then you've got to write a lyric yeah. about it. So it's got to be done in basically a line or two. And so, uh, you know, um, it, it, it the metaphorical, it's how how direct do you want to go to the point and it's funny because in this song for example i actually get right to the point for a change normally i'm very metaphorical but i on this song i'm like you know basically you know no god is going to be coming to sort this idea out for you you've got to do it yourself and it's all social human interaction that's going to decide whether a woman has has rights to her reproductive system or not it's you know, the, if 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 there was a God that cared about that stuff, he probably would have been more precise about what he wanted people to do. And, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. And not 5000 versions of each religion would all disagree. Like, I don't think Judaism has any problem with abortion, but I know that, you know, evangelicals sure do. But I mm. don't think Islam does, for example. But yet they'll, you know, potentially chop your hand off if you steal. So. Mm big difference there right but it's supposed to be a black and white subject to some people whereas as we all know it's a very complicated very uh you know hard decision for any woman to make good i was gonna say you know like we invent these uh these representations to help us understand the world right and then conflate them with reality yes uh without realizing it in many cases uh, and then acting as though our simplified notions of the world 
are in fact a direct representation of what we're trying to describe. That's I think that's, that, the, that's half the problem. That's so totally true. I also want to make sure I extend the favor from Keith to you, Dred, because if you've never met Keith, Keith, let me explain why this guy's wearing a tricorn. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he has, in my opinion, uh, uh, he believes in a cool God that in the same way that models can be conflated with reality and we can overstep our ignorance or overstep our knowledge into ignorance. What what the flying spaghetti monster is, from my impression, is sort of a celebration of the fact that, hey, listen, you're not going to know everything. You're not going to understand everything. Here is a embodiment of that unknowingness. And it's not something to be afraid of. It's not something to obey or follow dogmatically. It's more of just a celebration of the fact that, hey, life is complicated. Go eat some spaghetti. Uh, yeah. Do you think that's fair? Yeah. yeah, that's yeah very good. And, that's and that's it very also apt. it's a succinct description. Yeah, it also means that uh, you can't have a religion that's not authoritarian or autocratic. Um, it's it's a religion that you rejoice in life. Right. And if I'm willing to celebrate a dogmatic God, I also have to celebrate, you know, even the God of celebrating non-dogmatic thinking at the same time, too. It's an equal sharing field. And don't post one over the other because the God that says, hey, you don't know, and no one really truly knows, right, is saying, hey, Everybody calm down. Let's just have some peace and eat some noodles. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, everybody. Keith, what do so, you So I was just going to say, I, I have, if you can see, I n not quite his noodliness, but I do oh. have the invisible pink unicorn. Can you see that? I have oh. to turn my wrist <laughs> nice. There. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah, there it is. Yeah, very for, nice. the, um, for those who are listening on radio or podcast, we record this on, on Zoom and put it on uh, YouTube. So you can see these images if yeah. you want to by, by looking for digital free thought radio. I think you still have trouble finding the invisible pink unicorn regardless. But yes, you're right. You're right. We don't <laughs> want to disappoint our listeners. Well, it was it was funny because I actually posted when I got this. This was the first tattoo I ever got because it was, you know, it was me in a nutshell, really. And I I um, I um posted it online and the lady who created it reached out. Um. And uh, she has a thing now called the friendly faces of atheism, which I love, you know, a positive yeah, trying cool. to show show the world that we are just, you know, the four coolest dudes in the world. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, um, especially Dread. And, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, he's you know, cool. he's pretty cool. And... He's pretty cool. He might be the coolest. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that might but be accurate. <laughs> I was, uh, Dread, just so you know, I was so tempted and I still might get his noodliness somewhere nice. if i've got any room left on my skin so we'll see <laughs> i, I want to go well i'm in full support of that dread i'd like to <clears throat> touch on this because i think you hit something really interesting we conflate our models that we come up with with reality you said we conflate them with reality i find more often not than not it's it's charitable to say that we conflate them with reality off more often we conflate them with our biases and typically yes, of course we have a prejudice that we hold and we get a piece of data that we don't necessarily entirely understand but we think it confirms something that we deeply hold to be true, we will just use that in as, as an excuse to further help put more confidence in that prejudice rather than actual reality, more often than not. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think at latest count, there's something like 287 recognized cognitive biases that have been described and uh, defined. Wow. So that's a lot. And, yeah. you know regardless of how well you think you think um you're still subject to biases that uh you don't necessarily recognize in yourself yeah you always have to be on guard essentially you always you have to be on guard you know good cognition and good reason and good logic is a matter of practice it's not a matter of uh, being gifted with it mm -hmm. you have to practice it and and so you have to always be sort of vigilant and on guard of your own thinking to make sure that um, these things aren't creeping in and shutting you down, right? Mm, yeah, for your own mental health too, I would say. Keith, it looks like you're about to say something. Yeah, I was just gonna say, Dred, I, I, I wanted to ask you guys all this to, to get your opinion on what you just said, Dred, is of course everybody has biases, but w would you agree that the people who understand the concept of this, and they understand, and I would call them skeptics like myself and probably yep. all three of you, mm -hmm. uh, approach things in a way that minimizes the chances of being wrong. You see what I'm getting yes. at? So like, I hear what you're saying. Uh, how, how, what do you think? 
right? Absolutely. Well, yeah. isn't that the basis of the scientific method, right? Is, you know, you start with a hypothesis and then you develop ways to test whether that is false, uh, you know, falsifiability, and then using Bayesian inference to update your priors and all that good stuff. I know that might be terminology, you know, some of the audience wouldn't recognize, but it's mm. worth learning about for mm. sure. And I yeah. agree 100%, Keith. I'm going to throw this out. I think that um, the ability to not be wrong on things is sort of like falling into, or is sort of like driving on a flat road. Like, yeah, you are good on a level playing field. You're driving on a more or less pothole free road. But if you have a poor standard of evidence, it's almost as if you're falling into every pothole, every single crevice, every single crack in the pavement, right? But as you become educated and more skeptical, yes, you won't fall into as many grooves or potholes or imperfections in the road. However, you're still not immune from falling into deeper, you know, holes. Or yeah, like yeah. yeah. Sinkholes right. and stuff like that. So the those, hazards are still I, there. Your risk of running into them lo is lower. Right. Just by virtue so, uh, of you being correct. good at it. Correct. You'll, but you'll still have the same mechanics to pull yourself out as anyone else, but you yeah. still need to watch out. I, the way I say it, like the smarter someone is the, and they're still in like some sort of like cognitive dissonance, it's just a deeper level of cognitive oh, dissonance. Absolutely. And because absolutely. smart people are very good at convincing themselves that they're right. And that's, yeah. a, and the smarter they are, the harder it is to get them back out of that, that, that sinkhole. Oh, dread. You know, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just mention, you know, I, I don't, use this as a means to brag, but I am a Menson. And I find that uh, in my, in that community, that's mm -hmm. exactly what happens there, yeah. uh, Wombat, is that these, you know, in many cases, there are people who, who think they're so smart that they've got it all figured out and are impervious, right? Impervious. Yes. To any kind of criticism or conflicting information. They just, you know, they're not willing to say, I don't know. Right. They, they think just by virtue of being intelligent, right. that uh, that automatically grants them a, a, a sort of a level of rightness. Yes. That, yes. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll just think this out, you know, and, mm -hmm. you and, know, it, can happen and it just doesn't work that way. Because pride is a it's very community. frustrating. Keith? I, I just wanted to give you guys a cool example of how the scientific method was effective recently for me was, so I just got back from Ireland. I went literally as soon as New Year turned, we got on a flight. So it was, you know, a bit of a tiring few days. But but my dad, I think I told you guys that my dad is um, a geologist. So it's what he he's done his whole, whole life. And, oh, cool. you know, he's a very good one. And um, all my daughters wanted to do when we got there was go fossil hunting, which is oh, cool. what I told them about when, when I was young, is we have literally got... Well, they're ice cream tubs, but you don't really have ice cream in the same format here. The way they sell it normally is like a tub about, you know, I'd say yeah. eight inches by six inches deep type of a thing. Anyway, they're full. We've got literally thousands of fossils. And it was just the idea of I loved see, see having my daughters see science in real time and, and how a hypothesis is tested and becomes a verifiable thing. And wow. um, then it's repeatable. It suggests that it could be true, but not always true, right. and so on. Right. So what happened was we went down to the beach where, where my dad. By the way, you guys would just love it so much. It's, it's, it's a geologist's dream. So it's basically any a curious person's dream. Is what it used to be a volcanic area, Northern Ireland. It's not anymore, obviously. But when it was, you can see the line of the. I think it's the Cretaceous to Jurassic period that literally the change. Oh between the stones coming down the side of the mountain and heading along the beach. And it, and you see it just, it's black rock, black rock, black rock, and then light gray rock. It's one line of billions of lines of, of rock formation. It's incredible to see. But my dad was like, well, because of this here and the line, if we go down to this beach where this is, and we look just past into the sort of um, slightly softer clay that used to be under the water, but has now come up, what we should find is tons of sea life uh, fossils that were around that time, which is 200 million years ago. Mm -hmm. So we go down to the beach. Now, I already know, of course, I've been down a thousand times. It's a, it was a lifestyle for us, but the girls hadn't. And they went down and they were their eyes were just 
they could not believe it. We moved one big rock. And my dad says, right, just dig in this, dig in the thing. And within, I don't know, five minutes, they had 10 fossils each. Nice. And I mean, like perfect little starfish and crustaceans and little things that were, that have been sitting there or, you know, stuck in the same spot for 200 million years and they just it just blew their mind because they're big dinosaur fans you know and yeah. it was like this was alive this was probably stood on by one while it was yeah. you know and drinking or like, whatever thanks for freeing me wait don't put me in that ice cream tub i just yeah. no <laughs> yeah 200 million years i've been waiting <laughs> it's okay i can wait another 50 million years you humans won't be along for long all right yeah, That's you won't true. be around as long. So yeah, I just wanted to, sh I just wanted to give that example, dread of how, you know, yeah, like that's we, awesome. you know, by 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 hypothesizing of where things were, where the geological column was at that time, and knowing about how things have changed since, we were able to show my daughters just exactly where to look, and no, there's what right. they find. Larry, yeah, that's you, awesome. Larry, so you, you so you don't take the past for granted. We get it. We get it, Dred. <laughs> Larry, you had mentioned hey, something oh. about science making prophecy. Yeah, no, there's uh, a lot of all these religions saying that they have prophets, you know, and that they can tell the future and stuff. But just that little simple uh, example that Keith gave just a minute ago it says, well, from this and this, this line of, of um, ge geologic rock here, if we follow this down, I predict. I prophesy yeah. that if we go to this place and look for fossils, we'll find it. It's just like they found that uh, that Precambrian fish uh, from look, you know, the one that theoretically walked from water to the to the to the land yeah. because they knew the history of the area of Earth mm. and knew which area to go to to look for that particular exposed rock from that period, and they found it. Let science me this making out. prophecy oh no you guys are wrong let me explain why you're wrong larry let me explain why you're wrong keith Lowell. so let me explain why you're wrong Dredd. please that do lane, that <laughs> line of granite leading to the from black to to white rock that's god's ice cream tub and the fossils that you found in there are simply because it's his marbled them. ice cream yeah, yeah you put it on the pole path for and us? put them in the ground and you found them and you think oh 200 million <clears throat> years this that this like no, no that's I, God's i heard it was tub. I heard it was Satan did it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, have you noticed how they go through levels of cognitive bias? So like mm. at, at first it's like, no, 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 it's not. That's not really a fossil. Then mm -hmm. you show them how it's a fossil and you show them how, and they're like, well, okay, it's a, it, well, I mean, is it? And then you show them how, they, and they, yeah, but how do you know it's that old? And then you yeah. show them how dating works and how accurate it can be to within a few thousand years. Right. And then the, each bias falls off, but it still maybe becomes, well, okay, it's a fossil and okay, it's 200 million years old, but yeah. God they, must they have put that, it there. Uh, that's, that's the they damage. They call that moving the you know, goalpost. Right. But, and moving the goalpost, yeah. that damage comes from the extra levels of indoctrination. If you get to people and teach them these critical tools before they even get indoctrinated, they'll be they'll jump on board with the first standard of good evidence that you can present to them that's justifiable, falsifiable, testable, repeatable, they'll understand that. They'll eat that like, um, I like to think of it as like, uh, uh, a lot of people don't like vegetables, but there is a point in your life where you're like, hey, vegetables are pretty good. Like your brain stops caring about sugar when you're a kid and starts thinking about long-term nutrients. And when you start realizing like the value of nutritious data, high quality and uh, data with a good integrity, you realize I'd rather have this than the promises that my pastor was telling me. Because even though the world doesn't tell me what I want to know, it does tell me things that I find to be far more reliable and might, that keep me more safe and keep me more in line with what I want. There's there's one last point I want to make before we break to the half, and then we can continue this conversation. In Tennessee, the one of the Bible belts of America, we have a bunch of rocks. The town that I'm living in has a bunch of rocks on both sides of the highway. You can stop by any of those highways, pull out a rock, almost at random, crack it, and you might find a really cool fossil called Constellara fabulosa. If we're speaking about fossils, it's one of my favorite ones. Really beautiful in term. It's a, it's a, it's the back of a shell of an animal that lived about 140 million years ago. Sea life has stars embedded all the way around it, and it's a beautiful fossil. It's used by the oil industry because they will dig down until they find that fossil, and then dig down. Right. 
further below that because they know that's where they oil know is. that because right. they know they may not sell it as much but they know the fact of where you find these fossils you will find oil underneath it they understand the mechanics and whether it's the people who actually do the digging or the people who benefit from them follow a more dogmatic view of the world is fine but the scientists who know where to dig use that as your keep, keep as your sure. sort of that technology it, and that it, understanding. You know, I it's like just wanted to show gold, you guys right? it real quick. Sorry, Dre. Oh, no, go ahead. I just wanted to show you guys. My daughter brought them down for us oh. to show you. I know some people won't be able to see if they're just listening in, but this should focus on this, I believe, if I get out of the way. There it goes. It's almost focusing. Oh, we yeah. see it. Yeah, it's nice, nice. It's like a uh, back go. end of a show. A little yeah. rod. It's like a lot blue. like Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. There you go. You there you Pentagonal go. Pentagonal rod. Highly yeah. And then here's a, check out the show. Here is a perfect starfish. Oh yeah! Oh, yeah. very cool. And if wow, you look, you can that. see its little, it, you know, its little it, stems flower. It on looks it. like it looks like me lucky charms. They're magically <laughs> delicious. <laughs> oh, I left I those say, in Ireland. Darn it! <laughs> I, say, I say once once per episode, some guest has to try an Irish yeah. accent. That's all it is. Right. Well, we need <laughs> to take a long. break now. So I'm, this I'm is eighty six percent Irish. So. <laughs> yeah. Aren't this we is all, the digital. Aren't we all dread. <laughs> <laughs> this is the digital free thought radio hour on WOCO Radio 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. We'll be right back after this short break. Hello, and welcome back to the second half of the digital free thought radio hour. I'm Doubter Five, and we're on WOCO Radio 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Let's take just a moment to talk about the Atheist Society of Knoxville. ASK was founded in 2002. We're in our 21st year now and have over 1,000, well, actually 1,100 members. We have weekly in-person meetings every Tuesday evening in Knoxville's Old City at Barley's Taproom and Pizzeria. Look for us inside at the high top table, or if it's pretty weather, outside on the deck. You can find us on Facebook, meetup.com, or go to our website at knoxvilleatheist.org, or just Google Knoxville Atheist. It's just that simple. By the way, if you don't live in Knoxville, you should still start a uh, go to meetup and find uh, do a search for an atheist group in your town. Don't find one? Start one. Start one. Right. Wombat, where do you want to pick up? Hey, I want to talk. We were getting to science. I never want to impede that. When we slow down, we'll talk about growing pains to wrap up the show. But you were talking, Keith, about the beauty of fossils, educating your daughters on it, and getting them into the idea of like testing ideas over time. The value behind that being that, one, it makes them less likely to fall into potholes that are like fairly shallow as they grow up older because they, they now have a good idea of how to be a good driver and how to navigate these things. But we also, as Dredd was pointing out, just because you've had the education doesn't mean that you now have wings on your car. You still can fall into much deeper holes. And in fact, the deeper the hole that you get into, the more effort it might even take to be pulled out. So this is sort of feeds into the idea of like, yes, it is less likely that you will find yourself stuck on the road of life if you have a good skeptical mindset, but it doesn't make you immune to folly and you should always be vigilant. And typically, the more smarter you are, the less rickety your drive, but you're still just as vulnerable as anybody else. And so always question everything, because just yeah. because everybody and, in the room agrees doesn't mean it's good. And, Go it's, and it's about having a, a reliable methodology yes. for testing and examining the things that you think are true. Right. And right? also on a willingness to do that, use that strategy, too, because yeah. the best methodology in the world is useless if you're not willing to use it. Right. Absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So speaking of which, I was, um, I had a really, so I'm not as cool as Dread. Dread is, by the way, in a place that is negative 37 degrees Celsius. At negative 36 right now. Oh man. Can someone, can someone do the math for me to figure out what that Celsius. is? Fahrenheit? Is that like negative it's 60? About, it's about well, you know, at, I, at, I think at minus 40, it actually, you know, 40. there's some point at cold, you know, at, that where the scales actually meat sort of meet I, at I minus can't, 40 I, is I can't remember what it is but... wow minus okay. 40 is where they minus meet. minus 40 is where they meet minus, so, i thought it was minus 40 yeah. all right so this 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 did come from a comedian so i'm gonna i'm not i'm not telling a joke but i did think it was very useful as a mnemonic to like figure out how fahrenheit works and why it's useful for weather because it's just basically percent hot 
Like when it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit, it's 100% hot, right? When it's 50 degrees Fahrenheit, it's 50% hot, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's a really easy mnemonic to like figure out. Zero degrees Fahrenheit, it's 0% hot. Like it's going to be really cold out, right? But negatives are when it starts getting really crazy. So like you're nearly at negative 40 degree, negative 40% hot. Like my, my brain has already broken the scale. Like I can't even <laughs> interpret that in my head. I'm yes. like negative. I'm, I'm much like, closer mm. to absolute zero than you are. Yeah, so like you're telling me, it can get a forty percent hotter, and it's still super cold, and we're still at near at zero percent hot. Like that makes no sense. I don't yes. understand it. Like that's really really cold. All right, yeah. science is fun, guys. Uh, speaking of which, this weekend I went out to go to a charitable event where a high school was hosting a robot challenge. The robot challenge was called the Vex Challenge, and the kids would build robots and come to an event from schools all around the state. Come to this one school. And at the school, they will reveal what the challenge is. The challenge was to knock off cubes off certain areas of a track and drop them into buckets. And the, ro and the kids had a robot that was multifunctional and they'd have to design a program and design um, contraptions that can fit onto that robot that day of, or a couple of hours beforehand to make the robot do the test that they were supposed to do. And I was a volunteer judge along with some of our coworkers and, and some other local businesses around the area. And we had a really good time interviewing a lot of different kids. What was interesting, though, is there was a period of time before the kids came out to do their interviews with us and show us the robots where you get to talk to the different judges. And some of the judges were like old hats. They, you know, had been engineers for a long period of time. They retired. And we got to talk about, like, the nature of science and engineering and why it's wonderful to instill that in kids. And more, and I wouldn't say more often than not, but a lot of the times the people who I talk with would start to infuse, man, I'm just so blessed to be here it's so good to see the glory of God and these children. And like, they were going to work hard to fix things like, you know, uh, because the world isn't going in the right place, you know, like, you know, I, I just hope we're going to be good, but it's in God's hands. And I hope these kids can be you know, like the shining light for our future. And the whole time I'm like, no, like God made the problem. <laughs> God made the problem. The kids are going to solve it. Like if God made everything, he made the bad things too. I'm willing to play with you as far as, th as that goes. Like if we agree that climate change and the reason why we need a sustainable future and why, and like an overpopulation, those are like God given problems. It's going to be engineers and scientists who solve them and, and figure that out. And like, I even put my head down and was like, no, God made the problem. We're going to fix it. That's what our job is. Like, that's what we do. Like that's, and you too, you're a part of it too, whether you recognize it or not. Like we work together to fix that. And I realized, you know, even like now, that is sort of a blunt way of approaching that kind of a conversation, right? Though it is frustrating to have to deal with that a number of times. So I'm going through the growing pains of learning how to better talk to people about that, <laughs> right? Larry, I saw you raise your hand. Yeah, What's up? I was just going to mention that the whole field of medicine is addressing problems that God crossed. That's what I'm saying. Theory. Right, yeah. right, yeah. It's yeah. almost as if the the growing pains of becoming an atheist is learning how to still stay engaged with the people who have those ideologies that you know not to be true anymore, right? That you know are faulty. And <clears> it's <throat> like, I, but I know emotionally where you're coming from. However, I know if I just give you the logical statement, it's not going to be of any use to you. And there's like a growing pain that comes with that. The idea of the additional empathy that you need to package logic to people. That's that's frustrating in, in, in its own right. It's a growing pain, it's, but one worth going through. What do you think, Keith? It's funny. I was just tying in both things. What you were saying there is um, I saw a great meme and I've seen versions of it. But basically, you know, it's it's some right wing uh, conservative person saying something along the lines of, oh, God created you as a man. Therefore, you know, you shouldn't be trying to change what you are, essentially. Right. It's an wow. argument against trans people right yeah. and then the person replies well um and he's like you know what you're right he's playing along he goes you know what you're right but you know what you're wearing glasses how dare you try to correct what god gave you right right mm -hmm. and then he goes yeah. like and you're oh and you're um you're uh using an, a hearing aid to hear how dare you try to correct what god and he runs down all this list of things that we you know very small things that everybody just takes for granted right. as being what are our sort of additions to uh, how dare you cut your hair mm -hmm. you know just going <clears> to <throat> the extreme of it and i just thought that was a brilliant way of 
uh, well uh, that argument particularly but just showing yeah. you all the things that, that that god if he actually existed got wrong mm. as far as you know you're like you couldn't even get eyesight right yeah you, know? <laughs> you right. couldn't even get eyesight right god uh, let me, let me... Yeah. well it's interesting yeah. oh, I, too because because they use uh, the eye is often used as the irreducible complexity argument mm, and yeah. and there you have it right there well if it's you know, so irreducibly complex that only a god could create it. Why did he do such a bad job? Right, <laughs> right, it's right. Hilarious. Make so yeah. many mistakes that yeah. we have to and live evolution, with. Yeah, evolution has actually created the eye 40 odd different times. So, in like, different ways. It, in, different it, you know, in different, in different, different ways. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. like obviously the eye wings, has evolved. Even. Wings have come about three different ways, at least three different at least ways. Three. Yep. But well, no, at least four because of the pterodactyls, right? Well, that's still at least three. If at least four and at least three would still fall in the same umbrella, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I when I do work for when I do work for at my job, um, I always say it'll be two weeks or less. Even when people like show up at my door and like, we need it now. And I was like, Yeah, it'll be it'll be ready in two weeks or less. They'll be like, But Ty, I need it now. Two weeks or less is also now, right? It, it, <laughs> I, I'm all about setting up the expectation window, and if I do it in, if I do it like tomorrow, it's done tomorrow. But that's two weeks or less still. Like that's yeah, a, right. it makes people upset, but it also helps to standardize. Hey, don't just show up at my door with work, right? There's there's a standard that your I'm lack of planning about. does not necessarily mean an emergency for me. <laughs> no, it's spoken <laughs> like a well through <laughs> IT guy. That's a good um, one. Funny, uh, Tyrone, it's funny because you were saying about growing pains and about yes. uh, we before we came on, we were talking and I, I it's just funny because I just had that conversation yesterday with my, the friend of mine who's also doing another podcast and we're we're sort of growing together. Mm -hmm. And it was funny mm -hmm. how, you know, I, I, I'm in my 40s now and I know I don't look it, but uh, <laughs> I was like, um, I was just funny in the last three weeks, I've learned so many new life skills that I, well, A, wouldn't have even, didn't exist when I was a child, but, but just because I've, I've decided like things don't really get done unless I'm going to do it myself kind of an attitude and not being mad about that. Just being understanding that the goal that you're setting, nobody else really cares about it. They can mm. be positive and they can be encouraging, but the things that you want to achieve are solely your, things and so i've now mastered how to do you know like uh, graphic design so i can do really cool thumbnails for my podcast episodes and like i'm i've just learned i just did my last music video that's coming out in a couple of weeks yeah. i did it myself oh that's so cool and and i did a green screen which dread will appreciate and um i did a green screen and i did like uh i'm interacting with old 80s and 90s computer games so i'm like falling off a cliff and i'm i'm flying through the air through all these computers i'm dodging the space invaders game where the you know they're shooting at you and stuff <clears throat> and i managed to get it all done just by basically i didn't know how to achieve an a, a, a thing i would youtube it mm. i would google it and i would figure it out and somebody you know i would always joke there's always some teenager who's already mastered it on youtube he just goes well here's how it, how you do it and it yeah. and and the talk about that mixture of of growing pains of knowing that you're a competent person, but understanding at the same time that there are people out there that have mastered skills that maybe twenty years ago we would all have considered to be like who cares? But now right. they're literally life changing skills, like being yep. able to make um, really cool transitions in a movie or whatever. Now that person could be making. Uh, you know, an amazing living doing that just because they've mastered that one uh, skill that makes them employable or whatever. So I just wanted to say that I, I've i been thinking about the whole growing pains thing of like, I feel like I'm starting again. Yeah, it's like in, you're investing in, in yourself life. and you're seeing those capital gains. But at the beginning, it's so small and a lot of work. But it, it at a certain point, the gains start to outweigh the effort that you're putting into it to the point where you're just so fortunate that you had started in the first place. Right. But there's that growing yeah. pain period, right. It, that makes it worthwhile. Larry, what's your thought? Well, the <clears throat> one we first started the, the growing pains topic, I was thinking more in, in line of, uh, uh, as you grow from being, uh, taught, you know, religious ideas at the very youngest age. And then you, you learn that those ideas are not necessarily true. And then you find out they're, 
they're pretty much false. And then you find out there's nothing magic, uh, supernatural in the world. You just grow and you grow and you grow and you're, uh, but there are a lot of pains involved in that too. Because, uh, I mean, I talk to people all the time online where they, their friends and family are falling away from them because they uh, they have grown past them. They they can't really relate to them anymore. Right. Um, and I, I always try to tell them to find an atheist group in their town or find an atheist friends because you'll find out that <clears throat> when you make these new friends, they will be um, valued friends. They will be uh, not friends and family so much because you you pick your new families right. as you People grow. Who love the real you, yeah. Yeah. right? The they, most these pains, of yourself. these pains have solutions, and the solutions yeah. are rewarding. Yes, absolutely. Right. You can use yeah. the growing pains to find a true family that loves you, who you are, the whole you, the most authentic version of yourself, right. and not so just important. putting up with you. That feels yeah. <laughs> putting up with Eddie, you. He's not just Caleb bearing Lynn, with you. Yeah, they're about. they're not yeah. busy praying for praying praying for you to come back to the yeah. fold, and uh, considering you a flawed sinner all the time that they yeah. interact with you. If I if I can throw out something a bit more personal, I think it's also useful to go through the growing pains to better understand yourself. Um, when I so I am I I'm I'm a, I'm a sexual. What does that mean? It means I don't really experience sexual attraction. And for the longest period of time, I thought that meant that I was a straight person with something wrong with me, like a low libido or like I'm straight, but there's something wrong with my hormones or balance. And maybe I just need to force myself to be in a relationship with somebody so that way I can like still, you know, act like the same as everybody else. And maybe it'll kick in eventually. Maybe I, there's some reason why I, I'm not attracted to girls and I'm not. And maybe to you're the either. next step in evolution. <laughs> What's going on here? Yeah. So for a long time, all the way up until like my late thirties, I just thought there's just something wrong with me. I'm going to figure this out. Don't worry about it. I'll, I'll, I'll just, uh, and I've gone through a number of relationships, but like, I felt like I was wasting other people's times because my goals or my interests didn't line up with what everybody else did or what they enjoyed doing. I, I only understood what asexuality was through funny enough, like a YouTube search. And then I started going to a rabbit hole and I realized similar how I did with atheism that this term wasn't as scary as I thought it was and that there was a term that applied to what my outlook was. And it wasn't just because, oh, well, I just didn't find the right girl. It was just simply, I'm just not attracted to, to people, period. Like, And that's okay. And it framed my entire mindset from something being wrong with me for the entirety of my life to, oh, I'm actually pretty normal. And there's other people who are just as normal as I am. And mm -hmm. if I, and there's nothing wrong with me and that I should just continue to love myself and be doing the things that I love to do and make myself happy yeah. and find people who appreciate and, and, me for being me. And I'm like, and express, you, expand, you expanded your definition of normal. Right. right. And express to different kinds yourself. of love. Yes. That's the fun story behind it. But what came with that was a lot of uncomfortable conversations that sure. I felt like I needed to have about with people who would, who would hear my story and say, oh, but there is something wrong with you. You just haven't found the right person yet. Or there is something <laughs> wrong with you. Have you tried uh doing this or that i'm like no you don't get it the framework is completely different it's sort of like talking to i've had a good friend of mine tell me oh you just didn't find the right girl and i said you know you're straight you're married you maybe maybe you just didn't find the right man <laughs> right <laughs> like it's the same <laughs> mindset though nice. i have found people who are who who think who i when i explain this to them they're like you're asexual and the way you're describing it, it sounds like you have a superpower it sounds like you just have an extra half hour a day where you're not horny and you can basically <laughs> fill that in with hobbies and now i understand why you got your phd and you can play all these instruments and you have time to walk dogs and you do like when you talk when i tell people about what i do on my on my weekend they're like how do you have time to do all this stuff disc golf and you're learning how to rock climb and you're learning how to swim and you're doing it's like where do you get the time it's like because i i just have time <laughs> <laughs> you know there, there's a there i don't know if you guys ever remember uh, Seinfeld uh, is the, yes. the TV series. Yes. There's the episode where George stops having sex for a week and yeah. all of a sudden he's the smartest guy in the group, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I'm hilarious. that guy 24 7, but I didn't realize that, that that's not a problem, right? right? And yes. I, it's just what you can do with your mind when it's focused, like incredibly focused on stuff. It's really great. Absolutely. Anyway, that's it. <laughs> oh, Keith, you, my friend, you're on mute. But anyway, the growing pains was worth it oh, because sorry. I learned how to love the real me in that process. And, you know, when I came out to my mom, like a couple of years ago, she was fully accepting of it. And that for a Jehovah Witness was really, really power powerful for me because she was willing to like overlook her own dogma to still appreciate me 
and I have friends and I have work. I, I let my boss know. It's not a big deal in my mind as much as it was before. And I feel like the more I express it, the better it is to just live in my own skin. But yeah, that's about it. It's worth those growing nice. pains. Nice. I was just going to tie what you and Larry had said together there with an example of um, the, you know, the, the Catholic, I think it's the Catholic church. They um, would often tell women to just deal with it in abusive relationships, you know, going mm -hmm. to the other extreme, they would say like, oh, well, you know, divorce or whatever is a sin. So, you know, I mean, really, even in any kind of marriage up until the 60s, it was kind of taboo to say you wanted right. to to leave or whatever and they would put up with you know getting beaten and getting uh, verbally abused and all this stuff but it was just like because of the way society was you just had to kind of go well i guess this is what marriage is my happiness is irrelevant yeah. you know and I, I seeing the change in society now um you hear these people complain and sort of suggest again that that oh somehow you know marriage is feeling for example is a terrible thing because the percentage is so high i'm like yeah but how, what percentages of those marriages really should have been together, A, in the first place, or Thank B, you. should still yeah. be together? And C, why are they still together? Do they actually enjoy each other's company still? Do they enjoy, you know, uh, watching the same movies? Do they enjoy the same topics? Do they enjoy a conversation? Do they still enjoy each other physically? You know, that these are important things. Yeah. Very I've heard people express it, uh, and I think it might be a good idea to have marriage contracts that are renewable every two years. Oh, interesting. <laughs> you, know, our, our you say, I'm not going to renew. You that. watch it. I'm not going to renew. <laughs> you know, I've always yeah. said, like, a lot of people will throw out, you know, divorce rates in America are, like, rising, or they're getting high, or they're too high, right? And I've always had the impression of, Divorce is a good thing in the sense that it's solving a problem, right? Like if two consensual people don't want to consensually be married to each other anymore, let the adults do what they want to do, whether it's, you know, union or disembark on that. You Or I'm sorry, uh, what's the opposite of union, Dredd? You're my word guy. What's the opposite? Disjoin? It, um, disconnect? I, I don't know. Now you now you put me on the spot. All right, Divide. all right. He's the Mensa guy. He just he just said I'm Mensa. I'm like, what's the word? He's like, I don't know about words, man. I just got the card. I'm like, all right, fine. Disconnect. But you should be able to do that because it's good for families when there's, it's, especially for kids who are like might be stuck with parents who like are constantly being bitter with each other. Like, hey, split up, be happy. And if it works out, if you want to come back together again, come back together again. If you're happy with other people, be happy with other people. But don't drag me through this relationship that you guys don't even want to be in at the same time, too. Disillusion. Solving problems. Disillusion. Disillusion. Love it. Not disillusion. 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 All right. Like dissolve. That, that was, that was dissolve the example with my family. Just so you know, Tyrone, yeah. my mom and dad split up when I was 14 and it was the best thing that happened to our family in every way yeah. my mom got her romantic relationship that she wanted my dad kind of got his freedom back uh we got to continue with the life we'd always known but have two happy parents instead of just one exactly and that's something that you only maybe understand later in life that your parents are people too yes you know yeah. that's something that was very hard for me to realize and was like wait a minute my mom was just a young teenage girl once mm. who had all these hopes and dreams so and so it was my dad and they ended up together and had us but they're still yeah. people and their lives that's didn't like their lives didn't your parents are individuals too yes um, you know they have right, their own right. traits their own likes their own habits their and and that things leads are into growing pains because you could live your entire life thinking oh my parents are these super powerful beings infallible in every way or you can grow up realizing, oh, they were just like me when now that I'm at this age and they're still just as capable as making as many faults and that they're people. And even though I'm a person, there are people, to, they're a person too. And like that colors the entire perception of how I think about authority or people in authority in my life, as well as why I should care about people because they're just like me at the same time too, even if they're older, right? It's uh, tie, it's tying that into religion tying that into religion Tyrone is I try to remind myself that the people who are indoctrinating their kids actually yeah. think they're doing the right thing by them Maybe. I try to remind myself of that even though some of them I think are just you know maybe not there's obviously some bad yeah. actors out there but essentially I feel like most people are trying to instill good morals and principles in their kids yeah. which is what I'm trying to do just from a completely 
uh, maybe more objective uh, or subjective point of view, but I, I try to not get too mad at people when I see that because I realize that that's what their goal is and it's an honest goal. Mm. It just leads to, um, you know, to it, it just leads to a perpetual um, b- bad state, if you want to call it that. Right, right. I have, so for example, a quick story. I have a friend named Aaron. Uh, he is... Uh, a guy who I like to hang out with, invited him to his family or his house many times, uh, questioned me on my atheism and then eventually told me, you know, I don't celebrate you, but uh, I will let you hang out with my family. Just don't be an atheist around my daughter. And I'm like, (laughs) so like I was already being an atheist around your daughter because I wasn't necessarily worshiping God left and right. Right. So like, (laughs) I didn't say that to him, but like, what does that even mean to a person whose right. name is from the Bible, who has parents whose names are from the Bible, who has grandparents whose names are from the Bible, who grows up in a Bible belt, right? Who is also homeschooled in, in a, by family who taught him from the Bible, like has sisters who have biblical names. He never had a chance to think anything else. So I can't hate him or fault him for being afraid of people who are different, who come to Tennessee from outside his you know, echo chamber and just be themselves. And that's not within his framework of understanding. I don't blame him for having that. However, in the same way that I won't fall, uh, be angry or, or mad at him, because I know he's just trying to do the best that he can for his family. I also have to recognize that I have a higher standard for myself with the people that I can be with and the people that I can hang out with. And if you value yourself, I say, hold yourself to that higher standard and just say, it's good that I have friends that don't want to celebrate me and i have friends that do want to celebrate me when i have free time i'm going to choose the ones that do celebrate me no no heart no no diss against the people that don't but i got only a limited amount of time i'm going to spend it wisely right exactly i got an email yesterday i wanted to discuss which is exactly about that point tyrona it was a disappointing email from a fan and it was basically like, I've been a fan of yours for 15 years. I love everything you do, blah, blah, blah. But then you started this podcast. It was one of those things, oh. right? And it was and it was very much a, you know, I, I can't follow you now and I will actively make a point of not seeing anything that you do, et cetera, et cetera. I'm very disappointed that you would feel it's okay to to voice that opinion in public type mm. of a thing. Mm. And so I responded mm. privately and I basically explained to her, like, who was the moral, had the moral high ground on this decision. I was like, what you feel to realize is that the entire time you've been a fan of mine, I have thought this way and openly expressed it and never once hidden it. Mm-hmm. And I said that the person that you've been a fan of and celebrated all this time has thought the exact things that you've heard me say on that podcast this whole time. It hasn't changed who I am as a person to people. It has the person that you liked and the person that you've celebrated was an atheist and is an atheist and is proud of it. Yep. So the fact that the, sorry, Larry, I was just gonna say the fact that you're aware of it now does not change who I was before and saying that you're not going to follow me now because I openly express it, even though I always have and never hidden it my entire life. It's like, do you realize the, it's like, I don't tell you not to come to my concerts because you're a Christian, right? You yeah, see that the difference there? Who's on the moral high ground? Sorry, Larry. No, I think that his friend is basically just telling him to shut up about it around his daughter. That's that's all he's really doing. I mean, don't be an atheist. You can't stop being an atheist around her. He's lucky you stop yeah. existing. Yeah, but yeah, he's, just, he, you know, he's just saying, uh, don't talk about it around her. Not, not that atheism is a positive yeah. A position anyway right yes yeah. right. you know it's we, not like you're making a claim about something it's that you don't have evidence to support a claim that others are making so saying not to be an atheist does that mean you have to believe in god yeah. while you're hanging yeah. around his daughter? Right. Mm-hmm. you know I'll, I'll throw one last thing out and then we got to end the show he also was speaking to that about both my atheism and my asexuality and like in the back of my head i'm like so what do you want me to do start hitting on your wife <laughs> <laughs> just like, stop no, coming around i guarantee That's... i'm much more physically fit than you i make more money than you are you guaranteeing that you want me to stop you don't want you want me to just start hitting on your wife now i don't understand it i don't get it but again i have higher standards of friends like you guys i'm happy to hang out with you larry go on ahead and i i see you you cutting off your neck uh let's let's yeah, uh, wrap up the show yeah, they're running out of time pretty quickly here yep. um 
This is the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. You can find this on this show on podcasts everywhere. Just search for Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe. If you're having trouble leaving religious beliefs behind, you can get help at recoveringfromreligion.org. Um, you can find my book, Atheism, What's It All About, on Amazon. Remember, everybody is going to somebody else's hell. The time to worry about it is when they prove that heavens and hell, hells and souls are real. Until then, don't sweat it. Enjoy your life, and we'll see you next Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Say bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Check me out on my pirate at YouTube. Nice. Cool. Bye, cool. <laughs>